From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back once more to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time, well, an especially warm welcome for you. If you're looking for cannabis information for the next 30, 40 minutes or so, you came to the right place. I hope you enjoy the ride. Before we go any further, let me remind you this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume cannabis responsibly. A lot of people have trouble sleeping. Have you noticed that? And many are looking to cannabis for some help these days. Well, there is a new cannabinoid that's making a lot of noise lately. It is CBN or cannabinol. CBN is what THC degrades to over time. Well, we're seeing that in a lot of products these days. And in fact, today we're going to talk to Neil Morata, the CEO of Indiva, about their latest release, Quick Midnight Berry Gummies, which feature CBN. A story on the initial talks for BC consumption lounges, which debut at the BC Cannabis Summit. And Health Canada is finally revising the ridiculous equivalencies for cannabis and drinks. And that'll change how many cannabis drinks you can take home. We'll have some shout outs to supporters and on Cultivar Corner, it's another gift from my daughter-in-law for her driving lessons. This time it's the Hazel Hash Stick and it absolutely delights the senses. All of that and more on episode 93 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get too far along, let's take care of some housekeeping. I wanted to do some shout outs to some supporters who have been helping me here at the Cannabis Podcast. JS and Jordana, three months as subscribers. Thanks for supporting me, guys. I really appreciate it. And Kevin, in his second month as a subscriber, what do they get? Well, they get special access to Cultivar Corner visuals, which are only available to members. And in fact, they also got their very own Cultivar Corner, which didn't make it to the podcast. If you want to participate, you can do so. Buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. If you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can buy me a doobie. And in fact, that's what Kaylee did. You may remember last episode, I gave a shout out to Kylie. Well, it's actually Kaylee. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Kaylee. So I got it right now. And Kaylee, in fact, bought me some doobies. So thanks for that. I always appreciate the support from anyone who helps me here on the Cannabis Podcast. Kaylee, welcome along for the ride. The BC Cannabis Summit is scheduled for April 20th at the Hotel El Dorado on the beautiful lake shore of Okanagan Lake. It's going to be a fabulous time. And I got an update from the secretary of the BC Craft Farmers Co-op, David Herford. As we talked about on the last episode, they've sold out, but they have come up with some extra capacity. So they now created a wait list, which hopefully will allow some other people to participate in it. And as we talked about last episode with Corey as well, they are working on streaming various parts of the summit, which will be helpful for those who can't make it at all. Tourism and economic development opportunities associated with Farmgate and direct sales are shaping up to be a featured topic at the conference. Tourism Kelowna will be an active participant. The Federal Cannabis Act Review will be a big topic. A panel of MPs is expected, and that'll be really interesting if that happens. And I had some uh, news myself. I am appearing on one of the panels at the conference, and the panel topic that we are talking about, which is kind of appropriate for the Cannabis Podcast, and that is Communications. Ending Cannabis Stigma in a Digital Age. I'm going to be one of five panelists talking about a number of questions regarding stigma and how we can best deal with it. And as you know, if you've listened to any of the Cannabis Podcast, it's near and dear to my heart. I'm as passionate about stigma as I am about cannabis itself. So I'm looking forward to that part of the conference. I'm looking forward to the conference in general. Again, April 20th is when it all kicks off at 420, the BC Cannabis Summit. From studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And since we talked about consumption lounges at the upcoming BC Cannabis Summit, this is an appropriate story and an appropriate time for it. BC is going to begin stakeholder engagement on cannabis consumption spaces. A representative for the province's Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General says, the feedback from the engagement will inform any possible future decisions about whether cannabis consumption spaces should be permitted and if so, how. Few details are yet available on what those consumption spaces could look like, but the BC government has in the past suggested that one possible approach they're considering is a special occasion licensing to tie into future farm gate on-site sales for producers. 
The Farmgate program is expected to be launched this fall. The Liquor and Cannabis Regulations Branch, the LCRB, engaged the cannabis industry in B.C. last year to gauge interest and gather ideas from federal license holders on their proposed model. Although expectations from some in the industry are high, others say they hope the province takes into account some of the unique facets of B.C.'s diverse cannabis culture. The LCRB is continuing to look over this feedback on potential approaches to the program's implementation in the fall of 2020. Although specifics on the plan are still not available, the B.C. government has provided the industry with some details on the Farmgate plan. For example, the province has also said they may not allow standalone processors of any size to take part in the program, although they would allow license holders who possess both a cultivation and processing license together to take part. The government has also suggested that growers may only be allowed to sell cannabis that they grew, rather than selling similar products from other growers. While Farmgate could work well for some producers, others say they don't think it makes sense for them, especially with the proposals and the provincial government has been hinting at. Building and staffing a new retail store will be costly, and for many of BC's more remote cannabis farms, the likely small amount of traffic won't necessarily make the model viable. The Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General also notes that the BC Liquor Distribution Branch is continuing to work on establishing the necessary infrastructure that would enable direct delivery for nurseries and small-scale cultivators and is on track for implementation in the fall of 2022. The direct delivery model is proposed so far would allow nurseries and small-scale cultivators that produce no more than 3,000 kilograms of cannabis annually to have their finished products delivered directly to retailers, bypassing the provincial distributor, the BCLDB. Processors will still have to first enter into a supply agreement with the BCLDB and will need to register and price their products before they become available for retailers to place orders. Although products will not be physically delivered to or distributed by the LDB, the province will still collect their 15% markup on all products. <laughs> and why is that? Not a surprise to anyone. The province first announced their intentions for future direct delivery and farm gate sales in 2020 with the intention of implementing both by 2022. So we will see if that comes to fruition in 2022. Interesting to see that they're at least starting to talk about consumption lounges for cannabis. And of course, that cannabis market, as we all know, is constantly changing, and especially the edible market. So many companies are competing for space in the edible market, and one that has made a lot of noise in that is Indiva and their licensing agreement with Wana. We spoke previously with Leah Teal from Indiva about the quick format Wana gummies when they were introduced, and they've now introduced a new Wana quick gummy. It's the Quick Midnight Berry. What's so special about this? As I indicated in the introduction of the episode, it utilizes some CBN in addition to THC and CBD. It's helping a lot of people find some decent sleep. And to tell us more about the new Midnight Berry Quick Gummies, let's talk with Neil Morata, the president and CEO of Indiva. Neil, welcome to the Cannabis Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Let's start back with your experience with Indiva. How long have you been with the company and, and what's your background in cannabis? Yeah, I, I co-founded Indiva back in 2015, uh, and I've been the president and CEO this entire time. So it's been almost a seven-year journey to to get here. Uh, I didn't really think I'd ever be the CEO of a cannabis company. Cannabis companies didn't exist uh, back when I was in finance and managing money professionally. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, once once the laws started changing in Canada – it became apparent that this would be a very interesting industry. Uh, and so I took the leap and co-founded this company. And fast forward to 2022, we are the leader uh, nationally in edibles with almost 40% market share. And uh, that's been powered by uh, by Indiva, uh, but you know also by the products we sell, including our own brands, as well as brands such as Wana, um, which we'll talk about today, and, and Bang Chocolate as well. And did you have a personal reason that brought you into the cannabis world, Neil, or it was just the interest? Well, I mean, uh, the business opportunity was most interesting for sure. Uh, it's rare that you get a, a nascent industry like this starting up, um, you know, going from what was ultimately a cottage industry to, to a well-capitalized, uh, professionally run uh, industry. But I also had some close friends and relatives that were medical patients uh, and so I had a bit of a personal connection to cannabis as medicine. And, and that totally explains the position that you're in. So give me a, a sample of what kind of experience you've seen in the growth of Indiva since you started it. 
Sure. The, the company's changed a little bit since we founded it. Uh, I mean, originally, the original, uh, let's say, new federal rules, the MMPR, for those that, that remember it several iterations ago, well before the Cannabis Act and well before recreational legalization, uh, really, it was about growing great flour and selling it directly to medical patients. Uh, and that was our intention. Uh, but along the way, obviously, things changed. Uh, we got our first license to cultivate in July of 2017. So it, it took us a good two years to uh, raise enough capital and go through the process and, and build the facility out, uh, not entirely, but partly. Uh, and then along the way, obviously, uh, the liberals were elected and, and there was this new platform coming for recreational cannabis. And that made it look like, well, the, you know, the, the, let's say the options in terms of what a producer could or couldn't do would, would expand vastly. Uh, and so we started pursuing uh, primarily licensing deals in, in early 2018, shortly after we went public and, and became a publicly listed on the TSX Venture. Um, and so our first licensing deal was Bang Chocolate. Uh, that was in, uh, in 2018. We did a deal with Deep Cell around the same time, a Seattle-based company. We just released the um, cannabis tarts, the jewels, as they're called. Uh, and then we did a, a deal, a similar licensing deal with Wana uh, back in March of 2020. Uh, auspicious timing uh, for a, for a new deal, but uh, despite the pandemic starting almost on the same day, we we signed that license agreement. Uh, we managed to get products um, into market coast to coast within about six months, and uh, and so the last eighteen months, uh, Juan has been in market, um, uh, Bang's been in market for about two years, and some of our other one products like pre rolls and capsules, those have been in market for closer to three years. So tremendous growth is, is, is what you've experienced. That's fabulous, Neil. Pleased Absolutely. to hear that. So let's dive into WANA a little bit, because one of the things we wanted to talk about and, and to have you on was your new innovation, the new release, the Midnight Berry, the Midnight Berry Indica. And can you give us a, a bit of a description of what sets that gummy apart from all the rest? Yeah, Midnight Berry is a little bit of a different take on WANA's very popular sour gummies. Uh, what makes it different in particular, is that it contains a minor cannabinoid called CBN. And CBN, so each gummy has 10 milligrams of CBD, 5 milligrams of CBN, and only 2 milligrams of THC really there to activate the, the minor cannabinoids. And CBN has been, at least anecdotally, found to be very helpful uh, in promoting sleep. And so that we know that one of the primary reasons, if not the most popular reason that people use cannabis is to help uh, get to sleep and stay asleep. And so this particular gummy uh, is not sugar coated like most of the other WANA gummies, uh, but, and, and does contain CBN. Uh, and so it really fits a, a very specific niche as opposed to, uh, let's say just being a different flavor. Uh, and, and WANA itself does a lot of research uh, that we benefit from as a licensee, uh, where they're looking at um, a terpene blend that's unique, contains 30 terpenes. So these products are, are really interesting as a result. The introduction of the terpenes, I, I think, is is innovative, and, and a lot of people have been waiting for that. And you, and you mentioned the CBN, of course, cannabinol, which is THC as it's degraded, right? Correct. And and it's really interesting to see that now, and I find this industry fascinating, that, that one cannabinoid will raise to the surface and suddenly everybody's doing something with CBN. Uh, and I think it's really remarkable. The irony, I find, is as you know, as recreational cannabis and certainly in our retail stores, what's the thing we can't talk about when somebody comes into the store looking for some sleep? Right. That's why I'm really pleased you've named it Midnight Berry <laughs> because <laughs> it, it's doing a lot of our selling for us. Uh huh. Well, uh, yeah, I, 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 fair point. Yeah, fair point well made. <laughs> yeah. Have you found uh, any resistance to to that because of the regulations and in stores not being able to really promote it from sleep? Has that, has that been a detraction from, from people adopting it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I think if anything, um, the product has sold out. And I think if we've had any complaints, it's that people have been unable to find it. Um, I think one of the just taking a step back for a moment, one of the consequences I think of, of uh, having a lot of new companies in a new industry with a brand new supply chain, uh, you know, all the provincial wholesalers were just as new at, at this as all of the licensed producers and all the retail stores. And so I think there was a little bit of rickety 
uh, structure in the beginning. I think it led to oversupply of certain inventories and lack of supply of others. And uh, what we're seeing now, though, is is the provinces realizing that this midnight berry really is popular, and so we're we're fulfilling bigger orders with the provinces now. And hopefully, that the folks that are 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 texting me directly saying, "Where can I find these?" Uh, hopefully, they'll be distributed as far and wide as as our other products. You know, Wana in Canada, um, our 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 store penetration is somewhere in the mid to high eighty percent uh, range. So. You know, it's very easy to find these products in Canada. They're quite popular, and uh, and the Midnight Berry we expect will catch up and, and be in just as many stores as Mango Sativa or Blueberry Indica or, or any of the other uh, uh, 14 or 15 flavors we have available. And you do have a lot of flavors. We have most of the flavors in, in stock in our store as well. And I have to follow along the suit. It has been difficult for us to keep the Midnight Berry in stock, so we're working to, to keep more of that as well. One other thing in regards to that gummy, Neil, that I wanted to get a little bit more detail on is this is also a quick format, is it not? So it doesn't That's need right. to go through that full digestion of the liver for the effect. That's right. We use a, an ingredient um, uh, called time infusion from a company called Azuka. Okay. And so uh, basically that that uh, uses a, a nano emulsion, encapsulates the cannabinoids uh, in, in a water soluble form. And this creates the, the faster onset that people ex- tend to experience with one of quicks. And, uh, this is absolutely a quick skew. We, we've been joking internally. Um, maybe we need to, uh, talk to good folks like yourself and, and recommend, look, maybe it's the midnight berry quick to get to sleep and maybe it's blueberry indigo to stay asleep. So maybe you need one of each. <laughs> <laughs> pairing, uh, pairing it, uh, you know, for wine pairings, it's kind of a gummy pairing. <laughs> so, uh, we'll see where that goes, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how people experiment with it and, and, uh, the feedback that we'll get over time. Now, I've had a, a couple of members of the staff who've, who've given them a try and, uh, found them very effective so far. So the feedback we have had has been good so far. And, and, and I find that interesting as we look forward, especially when we have these innovative products come in and, and a lot of people don't understand the quick format. Brilliant idea. What, what other innovations is, are you working on now at Indiva? Those innovations primarily came from Azuka and came from Wana, and and what we're working on internally uh, would be, let's say, newer product formats. Um, There's not a lot of detail that I can give now, but uh, certainly um, our focus has historically been on edibles and ingestibles rather than inhalables. We're very proud of the pre rolls we sell, uh, but you know, certainly we are working on new edible products that would be quite unique to Canada. And hopefully we'll introduce those in the second half of the year. So uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll certainly have more on on uh, on new types of edibles that we're bringing to market. Anything else you'd like to uh, relate to us, Neil, about uh, Indiva and, and what your plans are, or the Midnight Berries? Perhaps something that we haven't yet touched on. Not so much about Indiva and and uh, and Midnight Berry, but I think maybe it's worth just spending one minute talking about regulatory change that we're hopeful will occur in Canada in the next twelve or twenty four months. You know, the, the Cannabis Act is under review, uh, which is great. One of the, I would say, uh, let's say glaring changes uh, or, or required or necessary changes would be in the potency of edibles. This is particularly um, uh, near and dear to our hearts at Indiva, given, you know, roughly 90% of our revenue comes from sales of edibles. And so we we feel very strongly that 10 milligrams of THC is, is uh uh, might have been well intentioned and is good for many people, but not enough for a huge uh, chunk of the consumer base that's out there. And I think as a result, uh, what you're seeing is is people going back to the illicit market to get 100 milligram plus, let's say, edibles. Uh, so we feel very strongly that essentially as a public safety measure, we really should be able to sell a safe legal alternative. Uh, that's got 100 milligrams, let's say, as, a, as an example, if we, if we looked at sort of California or the Colorado model, you know, Michigan allows up to 200 milligrams. So uh, certainly we would expect in the next 12 to 24 months that these laws will change. Uh, you know, it, it, it's clear that uh, Canadians are continuing to go to the illicit market to get the higher potency edibles. Uh, and, and not just because the potencies are higher and they don't have to eat as much food, let's say, to get their dose, although that, that is important, uh, but also from value perspective. And, you know, the edibles that we sell now, we think are, are a fair value, but we won't need to charge 10 times the price and, and neither will you to your customers, uh, I don't think, 
if we are allowed 10 times the, the potency in these edibles. So I would say that is a big, that would be a, you know, we'll be big beneficiaries of it. I think the whole industry, uh, including all the retail stores across the country will be big beneficiaries. And, and then we'll finally see this category, I think, achieve its true potential of being, you know, call it 15% or so of the total pie instead of, you know, five or 6% where it stands down. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Neil, because that, that's been a big issue that we've talked about many times in the Cannabis Podcast. Those 10 milligram limits just don't make much sense. In fact, we were chatting about it in the store the other day and we had somebody come in and said, so you, you got edibles and, and and what kind of dosage are you going to get? Somebody referred, well, that's 10 milligrams per package. And their response was, 10 milligrams, that's crap, <laughs> and turned around yeah. and, and walked out of the store. And that's pretty common. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, I've, I've spoken with some people that say, you know, one gummy is enough for me, five milligrams, or I have to cut it in half. It's certainly a, a novice user, but in time, like with anything, tolerance builds. Absolutely. And, you know, you know, for folks that, let's say, have been making their own edibles at home, for instance, for many years, uh, yeah, they, they certainly require more than 10 milligrams. So we, we're very, very anxious and optimistic about being able to provide products that do just that. Yeah, and I really hope we do see Health Canada ad- adjust those values. That's that's my biggest hope for the future, and, and we'll see whether that comes to fruition or not. I'm, I'm not quite sure as at this point. Thanks so much for sharing that information, Neil. Now, let me end with my hot seat questions. I got the impression that perhaps you're not much of a smoker. Are, are you a regular user of cannabis? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how you would define a regular user, but uh, yeah, it's multiple times a week and uh, very very fond of the sleep gummies as well. Perfect. And and do you inhale or do you just do edibles? Oh, it's 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 really rare. I'm I'm a terrible smoker. Uh, so, I, uh, but occasionally, sure, yeah. But but I would say edibles certainly uh, would be my go-to. Well, that that's my second question: is edibles or flour? So edibles is going to be is going to be your choice. And my yeah. first question would have been: uh, Do you have a favorite cultivar? But because you're not into the inhaling side of it, you, you well maybe you do from a gummy. Do you have do you have a favorite gummy? Uh, do I have a favorite gummy? Wow, uh, I, I do like our mango sativa, the one uh, mango sativa. Uh, that's a, a terrific gummy I find uh, for daytime. Uh, you know, doing activities. It could be anything from playing golf to uh, you know cleaning the house. <laughs> so uh, I, I do like the mango sativa. I have to say, I also quite uh, quite like the Bang milk chocolate. And uh, you know, again, not not a gummy, but uh, a product that that we're proud to make. One of the most popular products in Canada, actually, is our, our Bang Milk Chocolate. And, and I'll tell you, uh, Gary, whenever I go to a restaurant, uh, whether it's with friends, family, etc., I'll I tend to bring uh, gummies, chocolates, and now I'm bringing jewels with me as well. And uh, it, it always starts a, a really fun conversation. Uh, and uh, you know, they pay me to promote these things, but at the same time. What's remarkable to me, and, and this is another huge catalyst, I think, for for the industry and for the sector and for this category, is uh, you know I'm hopeful we'll see on premise consumption and on premise sales at some point down the line. Uh, it seems like a natural fit. Every waiter, or waitress, or, or or restaurant manager that I speak to would love to sell those products, and uh, I, I don't think it would be a, a, a really harmful to retail stores. I think what it would do would spread education and, and really lift uh, all the boats, so to speak. Yeah, I wouldn't see it as, as competition, in fact. And and they just announced in BC that they are starting those discussions sometime soon. And I don't know if you're aware, there is a BC Cannabis Summit happening here in Kelowna on April 20th. At that summit, hosted at a local hotel, the Hotel El Dorado, they have two consumption lounges. Oh, is that right? Yeah, really about excited that. about that. And and right. I'm hoping that's the introduction that kind of sets it up for, for the rest of the province and the rest of the country to head down that path. Mm-hmm. Well, BC does tend to lead on these things. So uh, yeah, I wish you best of luck. I'll be at another conference on that date, but yeah, I'd um, love to hear more about it after. Well, I'll certainly be relaying what ha- what happened in, in later episodes in the Cannabis Podcast. So thank you for your time today, Neil. I really appreciate you giving us more of the information about Indiva and the Wana Gummies and the Midnight Berry. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks so much, Gary. My pleasure. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, it's another treat from my daughter-in-law. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Christine. But you could you could stop buying me weed. 
<laughs> in fact, it was the day that we published the last episode, which featured the Betty Blunto, which was a gift from my daughter-in-law. On that very day, she arrived for another driving lesson, and this is what she handed me when she walked in the door. <laughs> I love it. This is, again, an opportunity for me to try out something new that I haven't tried out before. And I also want to throw out some kudos to Kilo Cannabis. They're the store on the edge of Kelowna here, or right on Clement, where my daughter-in-law and my son Ian, the composer of the Cultivar Corner Jingle, have been going to pick up the weed that they and she have been getting for me. So kudos to Kilo. I met Matt when I was there, and the, the manager didn't give me his name, but enjoyed the conversation. Nice store. Nice to have some competition, and you're doing good service. I appreciate the service that you're giving to my daughter-in-law. Now, back to on task. Hazel Hashtick. Hashticks are formed by hand-rolling, mechanically separated, absent solvent, dry sift keef. Wouldn't it be easier to just say solventless, dry sift keef there? The dry sift keef is a hand rolled into a hollow tube like a pre-roll, but absent rolling papers. Hash ticks are a pre-rolled concentrate, and when consuming, oh right, <clears throat> I'll save the instructions because this is the first time I have been given or purchased any cannabis product and it had an instruction sheet with it. I wasn't quite sure what this was, and, and I read it kind of in, in jest. But then I pulled the product out and I realized, okay, it, is, it does kind of make sense. Now, a bit of a sidebar. It came in one of these packages, which is pretty common in the cannabis world these days. I'm going to pause here for a shameless bit of self-promotion. You see, if you were a member at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast, you'd be able to see the packaging because you'd be able to see the visuals of this cultivar corner. But instead, I'm going to have to describe that it's a plastic rectangle about three and a half, maybe four inches wide and, and two and a half, three inches the other way. You're supposed to press on either end and, and then I thought pull up on one end. That's the kind of packaging I'm talking about here. The thing that surprises me about this one is I have been having an incredible amount of difficulty opening them. <laughs> I've had customers ask me to open it for them and I've struggled and struggled looking like an absolute fool. <laughs> And then my brilliant son, when they were over and handed me this, he looked at the instructions, thought about it for a moment, and he went, well, it's just like this. And he pressed three different places, and it just popped open. <laughs> press here, press there, and press there all at once, and magically it opens. Now, speaking of magic, here is what we have inside of my hashtag. Now, to be perfectly honest, you might think that seems a little short. <laughs> You'd be right. It was longer. When it first arrived, and uh, obviously I've already tried some of it, I, I could not try it when she was there after she'd given it to me. That would be rude. But I did want to save some because I thought this is certainly worthy of a cultivar corner. And here we are. So here's the rest of the details. This is from Embark Delta. The brand is Hazel. A THC is 35 to 41 percent. And this is actually 34.45 percent. That's not quite 35. <laughs> It comes from a blend. It is a dry sieve and it's uh, from Delta is where they grow it. Nice little wrap that all that dry sift is sitting in. I really like the appearance of it. Not much of an aroma on it, but that's irrelevant. We're more concerned with how this is going to taste than anything else. My instructions for using the hazel hash stick are pretty explicit. And there's four steps. Directions for use. Uh, and for some reason, they're not one, two, three, four. There's zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, and zero, four. So zero, one, hold the stick away from your face to light. I think that's a safety issue. Zero, two, light the hash stick and blow out the flame before inhaling. Do not inhale while lighting. And they're very specific about that. Of course, it's all in caps, so it's kind of all light yelling at me. Here we go. Light the hash stick and blow out the flame before inhaling. I think I know how to do that. Let's light it. Blow it out. Oh, I did know how to do that. Hmm. Now, what was I expecting for a taste? Because the last stuff I had, I guess, was some uh, Blonde Lebanese, that legacy hash. 
And because this is a blend of some dry sift, no, but there is that distinctive hashish taste to it. And at 34.5% THC, fairly significant THC, oh, and there it is. <laughs> Mmm. <laughs> In combination with the big cough, a big rush. And as you can see, there's a fair amount of smoke billowing off of this, which is hash blowing away. I'm going to butt it out. because I don't want it to <coughs> all roll away on me. Oh, now 34.4% THC, <coughs> dry sift hash. Oh, <laughs> well, I have three hits off of that. Bam. Bam. Oh. <laughs> Christine, thank you once more. You can keep stopping by that Kilo Cannabis store anytime before you head over to our place and keep buying me real cool pieces of cannabis just like this. I'm going for another round. So what were my instructions again? Light the hash stick and blow out the flame before inhaling. Light it. Get it all in. There we go. Nice little one hitter it comes with. Fits well in your hand. There is a bit of a car pole in the one hitter. So you have to remember to use that. Mm. All right. There are a lot of people who like hash. And people who like hash are really picky about their hash. I find those that like the sticky black hash, the really nice sticky gummy press stuff, really like that type. And, and in terms of the hard packed blonde Lebanese, they don't like it at all. And kind of vice versa. It's going to be really interesting to see the first time somebody who is one of those types of hash users. I'm going to put it out again. And the first time to see what one of those users thinks of a hash stick. <coughs> and that's the problem with hash, always has been can get deep into the lungs and cause that coughing. What do we do hash for? Well, because of the concentration and holy crap of my eye. <laughs> that was just another one of those moments where my goodness sakes, I really like being high. <laughs> I really do. It feels really good. This has gotten me really super stoned. So if you've never tried hash, this might be a quick way for you to give it a try without all the rigmarole, without all the, all the other stuff that's involved with hash. <laughs> that's why my wife doesn't like smoking hash a lot because there's so much rigmarole. Of course, she doesn't even like the rigmarole of, or the ritual of rolling a joint. <laughs> this was pretty darn good. So a number of things happened when I got this. I first of all learned how to properly open these types of cannabis containers. Just a squeeze on the end and a press in the middle. And bam, there she is open. That was win number one. Win number two was another fantastic gift from my daughter-in-law, Christine. What am I going to do when her driving lessons stop? We might just have to go for a drive just so I can get some more weed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. I truly love you. And I love how receptive you are to what we're doing in driving. And you don't have to be so generous with the weed gifts. 
but thank you nonetheless. Hazel Hashtick. Hmm. A new innovation in the industry? I think it's worth trying. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. One of the, frankly, what I think is biggest embarrassments of the cannabis industry is what's happened with beverages and, and why there was no thought to a proper equivalency between a drink and dried cannabis. Because that wacky equivalency created so much confusion. Everybody was so used to when you go in to buy some beer, you buy a six pack or you buy a 12 pack. Well, with cannabis, you can never buy a six pack because of the stupid equivalency rules. The most we could ever fit into one package was five usually. Although some manufacturers got smart and reduced their size by five milliliters, making it 350 mils instead of 355. And that allowed us to put six in. Well, this is a story about it going a step further. The federal government is eyeing regulatory changes that could allow Canadians to purchase a greater number of cannabis beverages without exceeding public possession limits. The proposal shared this month in government publication Canada Gazette would change how the cannabis content of drinks is calculated and permit more beverages to be bought at a time, a move cannabis companies, consumers and retailers have long advocated for. The proposal, which kick-started a 45-day consultation period ending April 26, would make one gram of dried cannabis equivalent to 570 grams of a pot drink, an increase from the 70 grams of a pot drink the government currently equates to one gram of dried cannabis. And there it is right there. That is the whole problem. One gram was equivalent to 570 grams. Absolutely absurd. One gram of dried cannabis would also be equivalent to 70 grams of non-solids containing cannabis like oils. The change is important because the Cannabis Act allows Canadians to carry no more than 30 grams of dried cannabis or its equivalent at one time. Under the proposal, the quantity of cannabis drinks adults would be able to possess would increase to 17.1 litres from 2.1 litres. George Smitherman, President and Chief Executive of the Cannabis Council of Canada, said, It could make for a different kind of May 2-4, and that would be nice. His council started pushing the change last year after it found regulations allow shoppers to purchase 17 cannabis vape cartridges with a combined 5,950 milligrams of tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, POTS psychoactive component. Consumers could also buy 100 bottles of marijuana oil spray with 50,000 milligrams of THC in a single transaction. But those buying pot drinks found themselves more limited because of how equivalencies were calculated and because single cannabis beverages sold in Canada must also contain no more than 10 milligrams of THC. The law left consumers able to buy no more than five 355 mil cans of pot drinks with 2 or 2.5 milligrams of THC in each, but able to purchase nine beverages that came in 222 mil cans with 10 milligrams of THC. The formula that creates relative equivalency across cannabis products just missed the mark on beverages, Smitherman said. It wasn't working and was suppressing the capacity of the consumers to try the products out. Lisa Campbell, chief executive at cannabis marketing company Mercari Agency, said cannabis beverage sales have not been doing well in part because consumers want to be able to buy more products with a higher THC content. On the West Coast, 10 milligrams is seen as a microdose. It's not even seen as what you need, she said. That's why many people are still turning to the illicit market where they can find higher THC products, she added. Campbell doesn't see government's proposal as a solution to the industry's gripes about cannabis equivalency. Instead, she called it pure optics and the government's way of placating companies. It's 100% a false flag for progress because beverages are still limited to 10 milligrams of THC, she said. We should be focused on increasing the THC limit so that consumers don't have to go to the legacy market in order to buy edibles that meet their needs. And I can't say I disagree with Lisi in that comment. But at least they are addressing the issue that we can at least sell you six. We can sell you a six pack now. And that has been a long time coming. If you ever hear anything on the Cannabis Podcast that you'd like to comment on, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you want to connect up on the socials, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Cannabis Podcast. And... If you feel so inclined and you like what you hear, you can always go to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast and buy me a doobie. Thank you so much for listening. That is it for episode 93 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, 
This was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.